Well, welcome to Highland Heights Christian Church. So this is your first time. My name is Pastor Patrick, and our uh, communion meditations are always done by our elders. There um, are seven elders, aside from myself, and uh, we're grateful for the time they get up here and they share a message. Uh, communion is a very important time uh, for us to reflect on Christ. And this morning, as we venture into this message and our final, um, our bittersweet final chapter of the book of Acts, as we're in 28, I uh, think about um, all that has been done over this, the centuries by our brothers and sisters in Christ in order to uh, pave a way for us to be at this point today where we realize that it's not just a belief system, it is truly a way of life. Amen? You know, every human at some point in their life will find themselves wondering why they are going through something difficult, and every one of us do it. Usually not just once. God is usually the recipient of our question, why? We know that Christians ask this question, and to help you, yes, of course you can ask it, and no, it's not blasphemous. But the real conundrum here is whether or not we should ask the question, why, to God. Because after all, all of us who are repentant believers know that we can look at the Messiah upon the cross and the sin and the shame that he took upon himself to die for us and examine the scripture, scriptures that we are not promised a life apart from tribulation and trial. Otherwise, our Savior took it upon himself. The mar all the apostles died a martyr's death. We're not free from tribulation. We go through it. That is what life is. Still, the easiest answer to this question as to why should a, should a true believing Christian ask God why they are going through something or challenging in their life cannot be antiquated at all with a simple answer. E even after you and I would examine their situation, not one of us fellow human beings can have the right or the audacity to actually answer the question for them, if it's okay for them to ask that question. The real issue when asking the question why of God should be examined this way. Are we even prepared for the answer? Is the follower of Christ for us? The answer lies solely in trusting a most sovereign, high, almighty God who made us. And, and, and mind you, this will not be given in the duration of time that you and I want when we ask the question, why anyway? We want our answer now, and that's not the way this works. Okay? So sometimes the answer is given much later, and if you are more concerned as to why than the fact that you belong to a majestic God who created all things, then you won't be ready for the answer when it smacks you right in the face. And during our trials, most people wouldn't care for the answer anyway if the answer was a bed of water and you fell off a boat. The truth is, God wastes nothing on us. And nothing that we ever go through is wasted. God has a perfect plan and a perfect um, will, and, and he is molding and shaping us into something much greater than we ever thought could happen to us. We just have to get to a point where we surrender to him. And that is the hardest thing to do because we feel like we're giving up control. And that's what we all want. We want control. Shame on us for not realizing that giving control into God is not like giving control to another human being. Romans 8, 27, he says, And he who searches hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes, excuse me, the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. He intercedes. He is active. Sometimes, instead of seeing a detour as part of God's plan and his will in our life, we see the problem as a mountain to climb, and we have no legs in which to climb it. But the mountain is not the destination. Are you hearing me this morning, folks? The mountain is not the destination. The mountain is the road to your destination. 
So you must look for a pathway around it, over it, whatever the case is, but it's not yet your destination. And you know, even as a top ambassador, I wonder if Paul ever considered life's detours or sometimes God's destinations. Acts 27 ends by telling what happened after the ship carrying 220 or 76 passengers floundered. It, it broke up and those who could swim made it to, to shore on their own and the rest grabbed pieces of wood and they floated. But all of them, every one of them, all 276 made it to shore just as Paul had prophesied, just as God has promised. They might have all been wet, cold, and exhausted, but they made it. I mean, it was November, very cold time of year in Malta. This morning, would you please stand for the reading of God's word as I begin Acts 28, 1 through 15. After we were brought safely through, we then learned that the island was called Malta. The native people showed us usual kindness, for they kindled a fire and welcomed us all because it had begun to rain and was cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. When the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, no doubt this man is a murderer, though he has escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. He, however, took or shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. They were waiting for him to swell up or suddenly fall down dead, but when they had waited a long time and saw no misfortune come to him. They changed their minds and said that he was a God. Now, in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the chief man of the island named Publius, who received us and entertained us uh, hosp uh, hospitably for three days. It happened that the father of Publius lay sick and, and with a fever and dysentery. And Paul visited him and prayed and putting hands on him, healed him. And when this had taken place, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases also came and were cured. They also honored us greatly. And when they were all about to, we were all about to sail, they put on board whatever we needed. After three months, we set sail in a ship that had wintered in the island, a ship of Alexandria with the twin gods as a figurehead. Putting in at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days, and from there we made a circuit and arrived at Regium. And after one day, a south wind sprang up, and on the second day, we came to Petioli. There we, we found brothers who were invited to stay with them for, for seven days, and so we came to Rome. And the brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as Forum of Appius and three taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. You may be seated. Praise God for the reading of his word. Would you please join me in prayer this morning? Father God, as we come before you and we humble ourselves before your throne of mercy and your throne of grace, we ask God that you would help us to understand what all of this means and how it affects us to this day. But Lord God, we must read it all in the context of which you had Luke write this. So let us examine this and, and, and see the pattern of what has occurred here in our history. May it be encouraging to us today. So we pray that you would open our ears to hear your words, write your words upon our hearts, Lord God, and let us fixate upon you, Lord God. May your spirit go before us, Lord Jesus, and we do all this by and through your spirit for your glory, Jesus because you earned that right, Lord God. I don't want to get in the way of your message. I pray that you speak by way of your spirit through me to your precious children, Lord God, all in Jesus' precious name and for his glory. Amen. The natives of Malta were called barbarians by the Greeks because the Greeks considered anybody who wasn't Greek or Jewish to be a barbarian. And we also know, however, the old adage, don't book a, judge a book by the cover. Amen. <laughs> right? So, so here we see the natives of Malta hardly act vicious, like vicious barbarians towards them. I mean, instead, they were extremely hospitable. They helped them get on the beach. Uh, they immediately made a fire. They cooked them some food. They wanted to help them out. And, and that's something that we, we see here in the biblical record. And as typical for Paul, he doesn't simply stand around and let everybody wait on him because he's only the greatest apostle to the Gentiles to ever live. 
But yet here's Paul grabbing sticks for the fire because he's a servant, because Jesus tells us to be a servant, that we didn't come to be served, but to serve. Notice that. He gathered twigs and threw them on the fire. And at that point, a really extraordinary, extraordinary event takes place. A viper quickens to the heat, bites him. But a snake bite in winter? During the summer in Florida, it's not safe to go in the woods, right? But in the winter, they say you can. You can tromp around without fear of snakes jumping on you. This incident has been the target of many critics over the years. One criticism that there are no snakes on the island of Malta, but records from antiquity show us that once islands or areas begin to be heavily populated by humans, Snakes usually find their way out. Another criticism is that a, a viper does not, he strikes and, and he doesn't hold on. He strikes and he jumps back. But we all know, if you have any, any experience with snakes, that sometimes they can get hooked on a coat or a boot or a, a piece of clothing. It still struck him. And it is winter, so you got to be a little bit bundled up or maybe trying to because you just got out of the water, right? They say Luke was incorrect about the viper biting Paul and holding on, but there are numerous examples of these things happening where they get latched on. And the reason people struggle with the story anyway is because it's a miracle. That's the problem here for people. You know, they don't like the idea that somebody could be bitten by a venomous snake and live and show no signs of sickness. By the way, side note, snake handling is a joke. Don't do it. <clears throat> when the natives saw the creature hanging on, they said, no doubt this man's a murderer whom, though he has escaped the, city, uh, the siege, yet justice does not allow to live. And I think that's interesting. So this is their first assumption. They watched and waited for Paul to swell up and drop dead. Well, Paul did not swell. He did not die. And then they realized they had made a mistake. He wasn't a murderer at all, but a God. So they were wrong again. Their assumption was false. Paul was neither a murderer, definitely not a God. <clears throat> Rather, he was an apostle of Jesus Christ, fulfilling <clears throat> the mission that Christ had given to him. Jesus says this in Mark 16, 15 through 18. If you have that, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Virtually every one of these signs takes place in the life and the mission of Paul. And this was written for the disciple apostles. Look in the context. So when you go back and you read, you know, people will extract this today in certain churches, and it'll all be about what he is saying here to the disciple apostles, and they take it upon themselves. So they'll drink poison to prove a point. No. The three rules of reading any passage of Scripture, ladies and gentlemen, is context. And the second one is what? And what's the third one? Yeah, you got to read the context of what she's written. Now, you know you can quote scripture that encourages us. Speak in the word of God does not. When you say from Philippians 4.13, all things can be done through Christ who gives me strength. You don't have to necessarily read the, in the, explain the entire context to a brother or sister when you're stating something of scripture because you're speaking the word of God. That's what revelation is, is by speaking what's already been written, there is no more additional revelation. There doesn't have to be. We have all the revelation we need from God. We just need to pick this bad boy up and read it. But even more to add to this, Jesus had given Paul a directive. 
What did he tell him when he overshadowed him in that jail cell when Paul was distraught because his own countrymen, his ethnic countrymen had turned on him in Jerusalem? And then the Roman, uh, uh, you know, the, the centurions are getting ready to beat him before he says, is this how you normally handle a Roman citizen? And they left him tied up overnight. Then they throw him in this cell and our Lord appears, physically appears to Paul, which he had done many times. If you read the biblical record, amen, who do you think taught Paul? It wasn't just Barnabas. Paul states in the Corinthian letter that Jesus had actually taught him. Yes, the ascended Lord and Savior. That's miraculous. Correct Amundo. But he appeared to him first on the road to Damascus, and yet he is appearing to him here. The last time we know of his appearance, and he tells Paul to do what? Get out of Jerusalem and go to Rome. That didn't stop. Just because we're a couple of years down the road, and we've talked about this, how many times do you think Paul was thinking that this was a mountain on which he couldn't climb? But he knew what Jesus had told him to do, just as he tells us what to do. And you think, well, Jesus hasn't told me what to do. Yes, he did. Before he ascended, he said, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I've commanded you, and I will be with you always till the end of the age. That is your commission. That is your marching order. It's not a great suggestion. It's a great commission. That freaks you and I out. That can freak you and I out. Because we think, how am I going to make disciples? Another day. He had not yet made it to Rome. He was going to die according to people in the world, but he was not going to die. He wasn't going to die on this island because God had commanded him to go to Rome. Now, look, when we come back to the, 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 back to the commission by Christ to the apostles, Paul goes to the father of this general Publius, who was suffering from Maltese fever, a recurring illness caused by bacteria from goats, and he healed him. Luke diagnosed it. Luke is a doctor. He diagnosed it. Paul heals him. Paul lays his hands on him, and he cures him of the dreadful disease. And then people everywhere on the island are like, his dad was healed? I got a limp, right? Everybody's going to him, and Paul is healing. Why? Because Jesus had given him the ability to heal. Why? Because the word was going forward. The word was going forward. The power of Christ, the kingdom of God was at hand. The power of Christ was here, and the disciples had the ability of which you and I do not have. And I'm all right with that. I don't need to heal anybody. If somebody's going to be healed today, it's going to be because he healed anybody he desires. And what we're our commission to do is to pray for them. Our gift is interceding for them. Our gift is to lay hands upon them and pray. If God chooses to heal them, they are healed. And if not, you go into where? And then everybody, if you die in Christ, where are you going? People are more worried about, well, my grandpa wasn't healed. If grandpa was a believer, grandpa didn't want to be healed. He got the ultimate healing. He got to go be with our Lord. We tend to forget that because we look like this in the world. This is our life. This is our world. This is all we know. Yeah, I believe in heaven, but this is all that I know. Take the goggles off, people. The kingdom of God is at hand. You are in the kingdom of God. It's alive and active until he returns. You got a job. I got a job. Look at verse 16. And when we came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who guarded him. When they got to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard. But Paul was permitted to dwell by himself with the soldier who guarded him. Oh, man. Can, can, the interesting fact here. In a 24-hour period, 
there were six different guards. They had four hour rotating shifts. Can you imagine being one of the six guards chained to Paul for a four hour period, listening to him preach the gospel? Could you, what a blessing. Hey, Joe, we need you to pick up an extra shift. Got it. There's no more blessed prison guards in the history of prison guards. Acts 28, 17 through 31. We will read the remainder of the chapter now. After three days, he called together the local leaders of the Jews. And when they had gathered, he said to them, brothers, though I had done nothing against the people of the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. When they had examined me, they wished to set me at liberty because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar Though I had no charge to bring against my nation for this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you since it was because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain. And they said to him, we have received no letters from Judea about you and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you. But we desire to hear from you what your views are for with regard to this sect, we know that everyone, excuse me, that everywhere it is spoken against. When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in great numbers. From morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers, through Isaiah the prophet, go to this people and say, you will indeed hear, but never understand, and you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. That concludes the book of Acts. After three days, he appeals to the Jewish brothers. I have done nothing against our people, against our customs, against our nation. Yet here I am, chained to a guard, having to only arrive in Rome because I appealed to get here. No one had sent any message about Paul yet from Jerusalem. Nobody had done that yet. And why, you know... The word hadn't got there. They hadn't lost their zeal for Paul. They tried to ambush him twice. Amen. <laughs> they want this man dead. They want this man dead. And they had, they had tried to ambush him two different times. They're definitely going to get the word out. But this isn't happen chance. This is because God has allowed Paul to go to the Jews in Rome and bring the testimony of Christ to their ears. He explains how he had to appeal to Caesar to get there. So these gathered Jews, they're curious. Well, what's going on? Why, 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 all, the, why all the hubbub, bub? <laughs> right? Just quoted Bugs Bunny. You're welcome. But, but Paul, as there's no spirit of vengeance, no vindictiveness in his heart, uh, even in these chains, even in these chains, he's not angry. He's pouring out his heart. He's pouring out his heart. He's pouring out his soul to them. He is preaching Christ nailed, dead, risen. And he's using the connection to the Old Testament to show you that what's coming in this New Testament era. 
For it is the central strand in the tapestry of the word of God is the kingdom of God. It says he preached the kingdom of God. What exactly, you might ask, what is the kingdom of God? That's a fair question. Let me give you a brief answer to that. John the Baptist, Ben, John the Baptist appears on the scene, comes forth by the Jordan River for the nation of Israel to repent. When Jesus began his public ministry, his message was exactly the same. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And throughout his earthly ministry, particularly in his parables, Jesus would explain this idea of the kingdom of God. That all through the pages of the Old Testament, the Lord God, omnipotent who reigns, promises his people that he will make his sovereign authority manifest. He will make it public by sending his appointed Messiah. And so, the Old Testament is all about this promised king. Amen? Okay. And that's where Paul starts. Paul begins there. He reasons from the law and the prophets. He reasons from the law and the prophets because the Jews know who the, what the law and the prophets are. All the prophets are pointing to a Messiah. The law is all about keeping the Israelites, the Jewish people, in line, set apart from everybody else who's ever lived. The world is full of, of a lot of, of, of evil here. And, and so the law and the prophets all know it points to keeping them in line to get to whom? That was a question for you to answer. Who do the law and the prophets point to? Who are they supposed to point to? Yes, a Messiah, and his name is? Okay, point to a Messiah. His name is? Yeah, you're right. You're right. I want you all to shout it because there should be nobody left in this building that leaves today that doesn't understand that the law and the prophets, according to Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that he was the reason for the law and the prophets. He is the reason for the law and the prophets. He did not come to abolish them. He came to fulfill them. He has fulfilled the Old Testament prophets. So we no longer have to open up the Old Testament today to read uh, Ezra or Nehemiah or Daniel and think, oh, it's all got to be future. However, Daniel 12 points to Matthew 24, which corroborates the last day, which is the final day when Christ returns. Otherwise, everything else has been fulfilled in Jesus Christ, who has come, has conquered death, and is the reigning king. When you pray, you pray to Jesus to get to God. He's earned that authority. Nobody gets to the Father but through me. Nobody gets to the Father but through me. There is no other way. Jesus is the one who opened the door for you and I to not have to follow the Old Testament law. We are in the new covenant. Go back and read Hebrews. It's a new covenant, a new covenant in Christ. We have got to this point. You know, and Paul is reasoning all this. He's nonstop, day and night. He's preaching. He takes a nap. He wakes up. He preaches. He takes a nap. He wakes up. He eats something. He preaches. He breaks bread with him. He preaches. There's no two-minute salvation message. There's no two-minute salvation message at the end of a topical sermon about how our lives are fleeting and how Jesus can, can answer your thing. Yes, he can answer. Yes, he can answer your problems. But it is up to you to surrender to him in order for him to answer your problems. Guy is right. It's not about your feelings on it. I love the conversations I have with people when they go, that seems a little bit um, harsh. My God, blah, blah, blah. I don't care what you say, who your your God the audacity of that statement, if it's not centered in biblical exposition. The audacity of that statement is stating that my God is somebody whom I create because of what I want. Because it's about how I feel about it. That's not the God of the Bible. And it's tough to read something that hits you in the feels. 
It's tough when, you, when you're reading something, when you're reading something and it punches you right in your gizzard, amen? Right here, right about here. And you're like, oh, and you feel conviction. Yes, yes, you do. What did he do for you? He died for you. He resurrected for you. And he's telling you to give you, for you to give him his burden, your burdens, because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. That's who we have. So when you say that it's not your God, that doesn't matter. It is the God of the Bible. We have to learn how he says he is. We have to align my, our mindset, even when it hurts. And then when we repent, believe, and surrender, we follow what he has told us. And that <clears throat> does not make you more religious. You know what it does for you? It gives you a peace you've never had before. It gives you a contentment you've never had before. You've tried it all these ways. You, 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 you get content for a while, then you, then you lose it. And you're like, what am I doing wrong? He instills in you a contentment, a peace, a justification, a, 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 a calm you've never had before. He doesn't say he's going to rid the storms. Them are still coming your way. He doesn't say mountains aren't going to be in the middle of your road. He says he's going to prepare you better than anything or anyone else ever has. That's what he does for you and I. You know the old adage, my way or the highway? I'm kind of all about that when it comes to Christ. Because my way failed, his way is perfect. When, when they leave in unbelief after Paul gives this thing, he, he throws them a... <laughs> Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. <laughs> and they leave mad. But you know who's not mad? Godhead. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Because they gave him these words. These were, this isn't Paul just stepping out on a, on a, he didn't go walk in the plank here. He kind of did when it comes to his brothers and sisters, but he's telling them what the Lord has told him to say. And he's fulfilling what the book of Isaiah stated. Gentiles are grafted in. Anyone will be grafted in who repent and believe. The idea that every Jewish person ever will, will just automatically go to heaven because they're Jew is as asinine as saying that everybody who's a darker colored skin deserves $17 million for what we did to America 200 years ago. Where does it end? Where does it end? Technically, I'm Jewish, so my people were captive, held captive for 404 years in, a, in an African country last time I checked where Egypt was. Does it, you see where I'm going? Well, when, is it, when does stupidity stop and we just start realizing that we are all one race, the human race, created by God? If you remove God, then you try to justify everything based on color and where you grew up and blah, 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 blah. Who up, who up in this mug grew up poor? Amen. Hallelujah. Somebody. Liver and onions. Amen. A steak night. Steak night was liver and onions. Look, in conclusion, Paul freely continued in his apostolic ministry for a couple more years. But in 64 AD, a disaster calamity took place in Rome, and the city was virtually burned to the ground. Rome was burning. And of course, the story is that Nero Caesar... And his madness set fire to Rome himself. And somebody had to be blamed. And since he hated Christians, he blamed the Christians. Now, when we go back and we look at antiquity, a Roman historian Tacitus um, said that there was no hostility towards the Christian community up until Nero got everybody fired up because of the fire that happened in Rome. But Nero had this personal hatred for Christianity, and we're told that in 65 um, AD, both apostles Peter and Paul were martyred under the cruelty of Nero Caesar. 
they died in different ways. Peter, who was a Jew, was crucified. And of course, as the tradition says, he didn't want to be crucified the same way that Jesus was crucified, his Savior. So he has to be crucified upside down because that sounds all the more pleasing. Paul was also a Jew, but what was the difference between Paul and Peter? Roman citizen. Paul was a Roman citizen by birth. So therefore, they couldn't crucify him. They just beheaded you by sword. If you were found guilty publicly of a heinous crime against the Roman Empire. So his Christianity gave him reason under Nero's hatred to be beheaded. And this is what we must understand. He went to Rome after long, many long missionary journeys and spread the gospel to those who would, who would hear him. And, and that's what we've got to do today. There might only be 28 chapters in the book of Acts, but Lord knows that we are the 29th chapter, folks. Because we're moving on, and we're not apostles, but we're affected by the apostles when we read the book of Philippians, or we read the book of James, or Titus, or Jude, or 1st, 2nd, you know, uh, Timothy, or 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. Get in the word and bathe yourself in it. Get in the word and, and eat it like you've never. It's like you're going to Golden Corral on a hungry belly. That's how you got to approach the word of God. You go to it and you just ingest it and jump around. Don't start in Genesis and go all the way through to Revelation. Jump around. Start in the book of Mark. Start in the book of James. Jump and read a part of a proverb every day while you're reading 1st and 2nd Timothy and also reading Genesis chapter 1. And then the next day you read something else and you go back to Genesis chapter 2. Spread it out. But eat. You know, I think one thing is for sure. When I think Paul reasoning with them, he went back to Moses and Abraham and Isaac. He went back to all the truths of the scripture. So that's why we should read it too. We got to read the Old Testament. It ain't a God on the left-hand side of the Bible and a God on the right-hand side of the Bible. It is one God who wrote all of it. And people are like, well, God seems really cruel on the left side of the Bible. You haven't read Revelation 19 or Revelation 20 yet. When he comes back with the Lord of Lord and King of Kings tattooed upon his thigh as he's devouring with fire those whom he will trample under his feet, those whom hate him and reject him. And you know, we know people who have rejected Christ and hate him. We also know people who just are lost. Well, Get busy. What else are you going to do? Does this affect your boat time? Your Netflix show? Amen? Hey, 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 take reprieve. Take Sabbath time. You need it. But do evangelism work. Do disciple making. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you that Paul didn't give up when he saw his mountain and what a mountain it must have been. When he's laying in that jail cell wondering, here he is, Lord, <laughs> the Jews hate him. The Gentiles actually at this point are hating him. He must have felt so lonely and so empty. And then here you come and you overshadow him in that cell and you tell him, be encouraged. Take courage, Paul. And I love this because you're edging him along, just like you do with us. The only way we're going to be able to do it today, Lord God, is by your spirit. Repent and be baptized means repent of all the sins we've done and be baptized by the spirit. If anybody today, Lord God, wants to repent and be baptized, let them um, just come forward this morning, Lord God. As we pray this morning, anybody who wants to surrender their lives to Jesus Christ, we're going to pray for them. We're just going to pray for them. We're going to pray, Lord God, that you would just bless them in their lives. And if they don't want to do it in front of others, then they better come and talk to me. Because we're going to pray with them and for them. 
But at this moment, Lord God, we want to ask you to just move in the hearts, Lord Jesus, of every person here. Let us go forward in your precious name. We thank you for acts and for the encouragement. In your precious name we pray. Amen. You may